There's no doubt Jeff Bezos, the Amazon.com founder, has created an empire, an unstoppable one, it seems. Unstoppable. Even during the pandemic, with record job losses across the country and families heading to food banks for the first time, Bezos saw his net worth grow by $75 billion in 2020 to $188 billion, while early in the year, his company Amazon joined the Trillion Dollar Club with three other members, Apple, Microsoft, and Alphabet. But if there's one rule in economics, it's that nothing comes for free. So what's been the cost of this sort of in unimaginable wealth that in this case, Bezos has accumulated? Well, whenever we discuss billionaires and income inequality, we often talk about it in terms of people, the wealthiest 0.1%, the bottom 99.9%, and the trillions of dollars that separate the two. But a new book called Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America, takes a different approach, journeying us through what inequality across America actually looks like. The book shows us how both small towns and big cities have transformed in the shadow of Bezos's company, stamped by Amazon's almost ironic goal of fulfillment. Reviews have called the book a horror story, a cataloging of social wreckage, and certain excerpts leave you stunned. For example, while Amazon's growth eliminated jobs at independent retailers across the country, quote, in 2014, the company sold $2 billion worth of goods in Illinois and $1 billion in Missouri without employing a single person in either state. So what do the lives and cities that Amazon has touched really look like? And is Amazon the cause or a symptom of a bigger problem? Earlier, I spoke to the author of Fulfillment, the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, Alec McGillis. Alec McGillis, thank you for joining me on the show today. Let me start by asking you about one of the people you profile in your new book, William Badani Jr. He was a 69-year-old forklift driver at an Amazon warehouse in Baltimore making about $12 an hour compared with the $35 an hour he earned years ago when he worked at a steel plant at the same location. He suffered from a variety of illnesses. A supervisor said he was docking his pay for going to the bathroom. Uh, and eventually Badani quit. This was a man who told you he had to sometimes pee in a corner of the warehouse behind his forklift because their brakes are so strictly timed. It's just one story, but tell us why it matters so much. What did it reveal to you about this larger issue of inequality that you cover? His, his story, his, he goes by Bo, actually. And his story was, for me, so kind of central to, to the book. What's happened at this one uh, place in Baltimore, it's called Sparrows Point, it's a peninsula outside Baltimore that used to be home to the largest steelworks in the world. In the 1950s, there were 30,000 people there, a whole company town um, making, making steel and earning very good union wages, union benefits. Um, the steel mill closed uh, finally for good in 2012. And this one man, Bo, who had spent three decades working at the, at the mill, um, very dangerous work, very grueling work, but also very meaningful, purposeful work with a lot of camaraderie, um, just a lot of pride in the work. He ends up going back to work at Amazon a couple of years ago, driving a forklift in his late 60s, um, making a third as much as he did back when he was working at, at Bethlehem Steel at Sparrows Point. Um, as you said, dealing with supervisors, hassling him about going to the bathroom, just a very kind of degraded kind of work compared to what he had been, had been doing. His story to me, and he finally quit after actually getting in trouble for pushing union organizing among the, the union workers. His story to me and the story of that place, Sparrows Point, is so emblematic of the transformation of working class work, working class jobs um, in this country. And in your book, you talk about how Amazon has segmented the country into different sorts of places. Quote, it had not only altered the national landscape itself, but also the landscape of opportunity in America. The options that lay before people, uh, what they could aspire to do with their lives. And you say this segmentation of regional inequality is making parts of the country incomprehensible to one another, not just uh, urban versus rural, uh, but urban versus urban. For example, you talk about Baltimore versus is Washington, D.C. Yes, it's such a kind of core example in the book of, of this regional inequality that's that we've been plagued by. Uh, it's gotten much worse the last couple of decades. And I and that's the story I set out to tell, was the, the story of these growing gaps between places in our country. Um, and Amazon serves as kind of the thread for that. If you look at Baltimore and Washington, it's such a classic example. Two cities that used to be much more similar in terms of wealth and scale and prosperity, now just light years apart, even though they're only 40 miles apart. Um, it, it, Washington was already one of the wealthiest metro area in the country 
And then on top of that, just a couple years ago, Amazon announced that it was going to give it the new, the new headquarters, 25,000 new jobs, high paid salary, professional jobs, billions in investment. Um, meanwhile, Baltimore had, had hoped to, to get that headquarters, didn't even make the final, the top 20 of finalists, and is instead now a city that has several Amazon warehouses. It's now sort of a warehouse town. Washington is the headquarters town. Um, and we're seeing that kind of segmentation, yeah. that kind of disparity all around the country. And, and a lot of the stuff uh, you and others have identified about Amazon, the exacerbating of inequality, the regional impacts, the working conditions. It isn't that new. We had the same debate about Walmart not so long ago in this country, which is a reminder that these companies are not necessarily the cause of our predicament, but a symptom of a wider broken economic system, a broken capitalist economic system. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, I would say both cause and symptom. They're definitely both. Um, and you can go back even further in history to, you know, to, to the example of something like, um, like Bethlehem Steel, these, these huge companies, uh, industrial companies back in the early 20th century, where, where for, for quite a while the work was, was also very grueling, very powerless, um, very low paid. And, but what happened there, of course, was through, as the 20th century wore on, workers got organized and their conditions and their pay got better. Um, and that's what's so interesting now about what's happening with this, this union fight down in Bessemer, Alabama, um, at the yes. warehouse down there. Are we going to see a similar cycle go into effect here where work that's very, that's very low paid and, and very you know, lacking in any kind of say and voice at the table, will that start to go through the same cycle, um, working class sort of uplift that we saw with the organizing and, and manufacturing last century? How crucial or influential, you mentioned Bessemer, Alabama, how crucial or influential do you think Joe Biden's uh, video intervention, his speech backing the concept of unions has been? It was, it was it was very significant and it was a real it was a real break from 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 president obama I mean, president obama never you know s stepped out like that uh on behalf of organized labor the other very crucial sort of break that we're we might be seeing now is is the biden administration taking a tougher line on, on the antitrust and, and really kind of rethinking how we how we approach these tech giants there are signs that that the administration is going to be um, much more active on this front than the Obama administration was. Under the Obama years, the giants grew only larger. And just uh, sticking to the politics of the current situation, you have Amazon advocating uh, to Congress to raise the federal minimum wage. It supported the Raise the Wage Act, which would raise the federal minimum wage to $15 and put a national federal floor on wages across the different parts of the country that you identify. Um, now, Amazon already did this in 2018, raised its minimum wage to 15 What's your take on that? Because while you're shedding a critical light on Amazon, and rightly so, they would say, well, you know, we're ahead of the game. We're ahead of the rest of the country when it comes to paying a fair wage. That, that is their line. They, they also, you know, something else they told me, I spoke with them quite a bit for the book. Something else they talk about is, is essentially, look, we know these jobs are, are tough and, and relatively low paid, but, but hey, they're better than nothing, right? I mean, back before the, before the warehouses came to that steel mill in Baltimore, there was nothing there. It was just, it had all been wiped away. Um, you know, I think the question is whether, still whether, whether $15 to do this incredibly uh, difficult grueling monotonous uh work that, yeah. that 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 work is so difficult that, that a lot of people barely last you know last half a year at it um at a time when a company is making so much money when the head the the yes. founder of the company his wealth grew by 58 billion dollars just this past year i mean think about that right this this is the scale we're talking about yeah. a company that it's um, stocks gone up 80 percent the last year. Sales up forty percent. Yeah, um, we could probably do even better. But bragging about fifteen dollars an hour while he makes billions, yeah, it is rather distasteful to say the least. Before we go, one last quick question. We're almost out of time. I do want to ask you about Mitch McConnell. You wrote his twenty fourteen biography, The Cynic, uh, which traces his evolution, his journey. As someone who's followed the man, what do you make of his position right now? Is he a weaker figure now that Trump's gone and he's lost the majority, or is it? too soon to write off Mitch McConnell it's it's too soon to write him off but his losing the majority was huge I mean that was that was his whole life's dream to become majority leader and 
Um, so it just it's, you can't really overstate what a what a massive loss that was for him. And and you know of course we saw back in the Obama years that he was able to to wield you know quite a lot of quite a lot of influence in the minority by 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 just this incredibly sort of unprecedented use of the filibuster to, to block things. Um, but but so far he, he hasn't. I, I, one has the sense that he's still trying to get his footing in in this new post-Trump landscape. Yeah. That he hasn't he hasn't yet been able to kind of muster the, the kind of just across the board intransigence um, that that he did with Obama. Although that we have to remember that also took a little while with Obama. It took a while in 2009 before yeah. before McConnell really kind of got his footing. I'm hoping Joe Biden has learned lessons from both being in the Senate with him and, of course, being Obama's vice president. But let's see. Time will tell. We'll have to leave it there. Alec McGillis, yeah. author of the new book, Fulfillment. Thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen. And make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.